Hello everybody and welcome back to GSL English. My name is Gideon and it's my pleasure to give you all a very warm welcome to the first episode of the English Natter. Again, it is my pleasure to give you all a very warm welcome back to GSL English. Now, today's video is something different. If you follow me on Instagram or you're a member on the GSL English Club on Patreon, you'll know that I put out podcasts to help learn English, to give you something to listen to in English. Well, today you are essentially going to be watching me podcast. I don't know how this is going to work, but one of my students suggested it to me. So that's what we're going to do. So for those of you on YouTube, I haven't started the podcast yet. I'm going to in a moment. This is just for those on YouTube. You're going to be watching me chat and talk about different things in the English language. So I'm going to start in a moment. But before I get into it, please don't forget to give this video uh, a solid thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel. Say hello in the comments. Let me know if you like this idea and if you don't like this idea. Either way, interact with the video because it helps me out a lot. But let's get into it. Let's start the podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to GSL English. My name is Gideon, and I officially, I cordially invite you to what I'm going to call the English Natter. Now, if this is taken well, then it's something I'm going to do weekly. But the idea of the English Natter is a really relaxed and informal English setting where I just talk about different things. We look at vocabulary. I express my opinions on certain things. We look at different articles. Basically, we just talk in English. So that is the idea of today's podcast. I have a program that we're going to go through, but it isn't scripted. I just wanted it to come across natural. It's something that a few of you have requested. So here we go. Now, bear with me because usually my podcasts are simply audio. It's weird having a camera in front of me. So this might seem a little bit strange, uncomfortable, but we can go through the weirdness, the awkwardness together. So what are we going to do today? Well, the first thing we are going to look at is the name. What I decided to name this podcast, which was the English Natter. Now, before I go into that name, I want to present to you a few of the alternatives that I had. The first was the English Babble. The English Babble. Now, Babble is a British kind of slang term to talk rapidly and continuously in a foolish, excited or incomprehensible way. Now, as much as I like saying the word babble, for all the Rowan Atkinson fans out there, it's a word you can imagine him saying, babble, babble. Give it a try and really put some emphasis on the B, babble. As much as I like saying the English babble, I thought for somebody that is trying to promote the English language and help English language learners, the definition didn't quite fit my motive. You know, I want this to be comprehensible. I don't want to come across foolish, which I often do. Um, and I don't want to talk rapidly. So babble did not fit. <clears throat> the next word I thought about, the English gibberish. I like the way it rhymes. But again, let me present to you the definition of gibberish. Unintelligible, meaningless language. Unintelligible meaningless language. Again, I like the word gibberish. I thought it was a great word, but it doesn't fit because I don't want this to be unintelligible. I want it to be understandable. Um, so you've got two new words there, by the way, babble and gibberish. So that is where I settled on natter, not nutter. The English nutter has a very different meaning. If you are a nutter, you are a crazy person. I don't deem myself to be crazy just yet. So it is not the English nutter. It is the English natter. That is where we're going to go. And to natter is to talk casually, especially on unimportant matters, to chat. That is the exact idea 
of this podcast. To talk casually in English, we're generally not going to talk about really important things, but we're just going to chat. Eventually, I imagine getting some guests on the podcasts, reading your comments, any questions you have. So that is something that I would like to present to you. If you do have any questions you would like me to answer in this podcast, in the English Natter, let me know in the comments and I will answer them in the following one. But there we go. So that is where we came up with the name, the English Natter. So let's do it. Let's natter. The first thing I am going to natter about is driving across Europe. Now, as some of you follow me on Instagram or social media will know, I recently spent some time in Italy, in the north of Italy, just outside Milan. Um, and we had to drive back. We had to drive back to England, which meant driving from Milan to the Alps. We stopped in France. Dijon, drove past Paris, and then to Calais. And Calais is the port where you can then get the ferry to Dover. The experience was fantastic. And what I mean by this is that we hardly hit any traffic. Now, we were driving probably for 12 hours, all in all. We didn't hit any traffic. It was clear. We had cruise control on, listening to podcasts, listening to music. There was no traffic. The sun was out. We stopped at service stations, had a nice sandwich or a brioche, panini, croissant, whatever it is. We had good coffee. It was a really lovely experience. You know, we weren't sitting in traffic for hours. We just poodled, which means to drive slowly our way across Europe. And it got me thinking of the comparison between that and driving in England. Now, if you have driven in England, you will know what I'm talking about here. But you know, the first time we hit traffic after driving 12 hours across Europe, do you know the first time we hit traffic? Once we got off that ferry, heading to London, we hit traffic so many times. Standstill traffic, stop and start. And don't get me wrong, I love England. Um, you know, I'm British, but driving across Europe, they've just got it right. Maybe it's because there's more space in England now. It's just so packed in and tight. But driving around the M25, which is the road that goes around London, just constant stop, start, stop, start. So that was my first piece of NASA. Well done to the road system across Europe. It just worked. We had no traffic. The road works just came seamlessly and went, and you didn't really know about it. So, yeah. Well done, Europe. Good job with the road system. My next piece of natter is Taylor Swift, actually. Now, I don't deem myself to be a Swifty. My wife is. She loves Taylor Swift. But I am not necessarily a Swifty. Now, recently, Taylor Swift um, did a tour in America. And she just, probably about a month ago, released tickets for her tour next year, in 2024. Now, I tried getting tickets. I tried doing the husbandly duty of um, waiting up, getting on the wait list. But it, it was impossible. I was fighting against people that was never going to happen. I was never going to get those tickets. But I did try. So we recently went to the cinema to watch her perform the Eras tour. And it was a great experience. I mean, my preference on music is more rock blues, jazz. I like that kind of thing. But she was fantastic. And I'm not ashamed to say that. She was absolutely brilliant. And I don't know if it's just because I'm getting old. I am getting older. I'm 33, 34 next year. But sitting in a comfortable chair, not having to stand for hours like I used to in my 20s at concerts. It was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. But what I'm trying to say is the second part of my natter Taylor Swift did a really good job. She performed for three hours straight and she didn't just get up there and sing. She performed, you know, everything was about the hair in the right place and the facial expressions, the emotion. So the second part of my natter is well done, Taylor Swift. I approve. You did a great job there. Very well done. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, I don't know why I'm talking like Taylor Swift is ever going to listen to this. But yeah, that's the second part of my natter. Good job. I enjoyed it. 
Okay, so the third part of the natter is I'm going to present an idiom to you that I came across in one of my classes this week, and I thought I'm going to share that on the podcast. Now, you're getting the idea that the natter is completely random. So I really don't know how this is going to turn out. You might enjoy it. You might enjoy the randomness, but you might not. Either way, please let me know because I don't really know what I'm doing, but I want to do something. And this at the moment is it. So please let me know if you enjoyed this. Please let me know if you want to um, me to do more nattering, chatting, whatever it is. So yes, I come back to the, the topic at hand. An idiom that I wanted to present to you is to start something from scratch. To start something from scratch. Now, to kind of give you the, the idea of this idiom, have you ever started something? And from the beginning, you're kind of fighting a lost cause. You know, you're trying to make it work, but it's just not happening. There's, um, you know, maybe it's a project or work. You're trying all different things, but you just can't get your head into it. So what do you do? Take a step away. You come back and you start again from the beginning. That is sometimes the best thing to do, isn't it? Just start from the beginning. But that is what this idiom means. To start from scratch means to start something from the very beginning to start again and we could even do this when baking um i've only i think genuinely i've only ever baked one cake in my life and it's a very loose term of baking there was a packet mix i did what it said i put it in the oven but some people like to bake from scratch they make everything themselves from the very beginning that is what it means so if we start something or we do something from scratch we are starting from the very beginning. So that was an idiom that I wanted to present to you in the Natter. Now, another part of today's podcast is we're going to read an article together. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pop my mic down while I get my computer set up for this because I've realized that I have not done that. So we're going to read an interesting article on how to learn new vocabulary. So that is the idea of um, this, pod, this article, is how to learn new vocabulary. So it is taken from britishcouncil.org and it is entitled 10 Ways to Learn New Words as a Language Learner. And I thought that this was quite an important topic to discuss because over the last week on Instagram and Facebook, I've probably been asked 10 times, how can I learn new vocabulary and use it? So this article was absolutely brilliant. So we're going to read it, read through it together, give you my opinion, look at some of the vocabulary. But also I encourage you as I read, use this as an opportunity to shadow read. So repeat after me. You can pause the video or the podcast, um, pause it, repeat after me and then carry on. So the link to this article will be in the description. So you can click on the link and read after me. That is um, shadow reading. So I'm just going to read the introduction to give the credit to the person that wrote this article because it's really well written and I do completely agree. So let's get into it. Teacher and teacher trainer Svetlana Kandibovic very sorry for the pronunciation there. Our latest Teaching English Blog Award winner shares her tips for remembering new words. So, well done, Svetlana. This is a really good article. As a language learner, you work hard to expand your vocabulary. You plough through new words every day, make long lists of words and practice with flashcards. However, when it comes to speaking, the new words seem to fall out of your head. So you resort to your old friends, words you already know and have used many times again and again. Remembering and using new words in speech is often a challenge for language learners. Here are 10 strategies to help you make words stick in your mind and use them in conversation. Great introduction there. I particularly like the way she said you plough through new words every day. If we think of a snow plough. It plows through snow, just gets through snow much, so much, <laughs> snow much so, so much 
snow. That's difficult. So much snow. It gets through so much snow to move it out of the way. So if we are plowing through words, which are going word after word after word after word every day, it's a technique that I really dislike. Don't do it. It's not helpful. And it, it doesn't really help. She's saying, you know, often to learn vocabulary, we end up plowing through word after word. And then when we go to actually speak, the new words are gone. So we just resort to the same old words we use all the time. That is what we want to change. So we're going to look at some strategies to combat that. Um, to, to, we're going to look at some strategies that will help you to, when you learn vocabulary, use it. Because that's what we want to do. We don't just want to learn it. We want to actually use it. So strategy number one that Svetlana presents, no random words. We remember what is relevant to us. Making lists or index cards with random words is not usually an effective way to remember and use these words later. Word lists and index cards are great for revisiting vocabulary you have already learned. But to make a new word stick in your mind, try linking it with something meaningful to you. You will be more likely to remember a new word if it is used in a context you find interesting or are passionate about. For example, if you are a football fan, there are more chances you will remember the word unstoppable in a sentence such as Messi is unstoppable, rather than just as a single word or in a generic sentence, e.g. Some people are unstoppable. I think this is such a brilliant suggestion. So what um, is presented to us here is, is using words in some kind of context. So, but context that applies to us. So like the example, unstoppable. Some people are unstoppable as a sentence. Okay, that's a sentence, yeah. But there's no connection to us. So then connect those words to something that we like. So here it gives the example of football. Messi is unstoppable. We now associate that word with something that we like. So to expand upon this idea, what I would suggest to you is write down at least five things that interest you. Maybe it's baking, cooking, driving, cars, history, geography, travel. Then as you learn vocabulary, connect the words to those things. For example, if we, let's take the, um, let's just take the simple adjective incredible. If you like travel, think of somewhere you have traveled to that was incredible and write that in a sentence. Bali was absolutely incredible. Now you have associated that word with your life, with you. It is no longer random. So tip number one, and I think it is absolutely brilliant, associate words with your life not just random sentences. Tip number two, learn in chunks and scripts. We retain words better when we learn them in small chunks, small phrases that combine several words and scripts, typical dialogues. For example, instead of memorizing the phrasal verb to come up with, memorize it as part of the phrase to come up with an idea. This way, you make sure that you know how to actually use this verb in at least one sentence. Similarly, instead of memorizing 33 ways of saying hello, learn it in a script such as, hello, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Another great idea, learn in chunks, and chunks is like a portion of text and scripts. Um, and, it, and this is so true with phrasal verbs. Just learning phrasal verbs individually is a really long and difficult process to remember them. So in this example, you know, learn them in context. Again, learn them in a sentence where we can actually use them. But learn, think about that sentence, think about a script, think about a chunk of text that has that vocabulary in it, has that phrasal verb that we are trying to use in it. Don't just learn them individually. Look at them in chunks and scripts and context. Okay, number three. I like this one. Use your inner voice. That, that little voice I put on there, it sounded appropriate to me, but maybe it wasn't. 
Learning is essentially an internal process. To learn a word, you need to get into the word world. Let's try that one one more time. See, we all make mistakes. I did that on purpose to try and help. Learning is essentially an internal process. To learn a word, you need to get into the world of your inner voice. Try the following. Listen to a word phrase once. Now listen to it inside your head. Then say it inside your head. Then say it aloud. Record yourself saying it and listen to the recording. Does it sound the way you heard it with your inner ear? This is a really well-written article and a fantastic suggestion. So the idea here, let's say you take a new word. Um, let's take one of the new words, babble. Okay. We say babble out loud. Repeat after me, babble. Um, let's use it in a sentence, actually. I like to babble. I like to babble, which is true. I think we all like to babble, go on about nonsense. Okay, one more time. I like to babble. Now we are going to say the word in our head. Now we're going to say that sentence in our head. Now we're going to say the sentence out loud. I like to babble. Now we are going to record. You get the idea. That is the process. Say it out loud. Say it in your head, how you imagine it to sound. Then you repeat it again out loud and record yourself and listen to it. Now, so many people are against recording themselves. I'm going to give you a bit of reality check here. That is how you sound. I know we don't like recording ourselves because oh, I don't want to hear my own voice. I hate the way I sound. I'm embarrassed. But the reality is that is how you sound. You've got to come to terms with that because recording yourself is a real honest and brilliant way of improving because we are our own worst critic. Friends, teachers, family members are only going to be so critical. But we can be completely honest with ourselves. And sometimes when we hear ourselves talking back, we realize we were making a mistake that we didn't even know about. So I highly recommend that. Record yourself. But here, use your inner voice. So when you, maybe you're out and about and you, you read a word, say it inside your head. Talk to yourself about that word. Use it in a sentence. Talk to yourself about it. And I also recommend this when you are walking around and you see things. Maybe you see someone doing something. You see a particular piece of architecture. Describe it in your head in English, but that inner voice. So basically like you are inwardly talking to yourself. Great exercise. And it's just a great, superb, passive way of learning. Tip number four, visualize what the word or phrase looks like. Drawing what the word means, either on paper or in your imagination, will help you recall the meaning of the word whenever you hear it. This method works well with idioms such as to keep one's mouth shut, informal, meaning to not talk about something. Very good. So here the idea is, you know, visualize what we are saying. So, for example, here, keep one's mouth shut. You can visualize keeping your mouth shut. Um, this works for some, perhaps not so much for others. But if you are a very visual person, I am, you know, and I find associating words with pictures, visualizing them really does help. So if you are a visual person, this might work for you, especially with idioms. For example, um, who let the cat out of the bag, which means to reveal a secret. Well, you can visualize a cat in a bag, picture it, draw it if you need to. Uh, a lot of students do that. They, they draw out pictures for them of how that idiom um, works in their own mind. Great technique there. Okay, five, create mnemonics. Try to create a funny phrase or story that will strengthen the connection between the word and its meaning, known as mnemonic. I find this technique especially effective when I need to recall words that are hard to spell. Here are a few mnemonics created by my students. Career, car and beer. Ireland is land. To lose, uh-oh, I've lost an O. If you want to try it, give it a try. Again, we're just finding methods. Not all of these are going to work for you. 
but this might, you know, creating a funny phrase or connection between the word um, and what we are saying. So here, for example, career, car, beer. It's just creating that kind of association. And that is the idea with all of these tips and techniques is finding the association that really works for you. Some people it's visual. Others it's that inner voice. Some people it's creating rhymes. W whatever it is, that's what you're trying to do. Connect these words to your life, to your English. Really does help. Okay, the next one. Use spaced repetition. Repetition fixes new words in your memory. However, <clears throat> excuse me, repeating them a hundred times over the course of one day will not be as effective as repeating them a few times over a period of several days or weeks. Spaced repetition. Use the new word immediately. Then try to recall it in an hour. Review it shortly before you go to bed. Use it again one day later. Finally, review it in a couple of days after this, after that. And I think this is a superb suggestion. Rather than just setting aside an hour where you will review the vocabulary you've looked at, this idea of spaced repetition is brilliant. So in the morning, let's imagine that you learn a couple of new words. Okay, over that next hour, you think about those words. Then at lunchtime, you use those words, you think about them. Then you do it before bed and you repeat that the next day. So this spaced repetition, rather than just one session of thinking about those words, you're just spreading it out throughout the day. And it just helps to kind of to get into our brains and our minds. So give that a try. If you learn new vocabulary, think about them at different points during the day. So maybe just set a reminder on your phone, vocabulary check or repetition, you think about the words and phrases you have looked at today. Maybe that's breakfast, lunch and dinner, or on your breaks at work, that is where you do it. Okay, seven, dig deeper into etymology. Before you look up the word in a dictionary, try to guess what it means. Look at its roots, suffixes and prefixes. If you know a few languages, you will start recognising new words that share roots. Researching the origin of new words may help you retain new words. Um, this is a brilliant example as well. So before you look at a word, I do this with all of my students, before we look at new vocabulary or new expressions, have a guess. It doesn't matter if you are wrong, but you're getting the brain working and you're engaging that thinking process rather than everything being given to you. You're engaging the thinking process. So if you come across a new word, look at the context and just try and guess what it means before you look at the definition. And then once you do look it up, once you do study it, okay, perfect. Look at the definition, look at the correct pronunciation, but then look at all of the information surrounding that word, suffixes, prefixes, its roots, its forms, how it can be used in different ways. Expand upon one word. This is so much better than just looking at five words and that's it. Look at one word, look at one phrase and zoom in. Expand upon that one word. Dive deeper into vocabulary. Tip, technique eight, challenge yourself with word games. The perception of a challenge stimulates the brain. Games that help you discover new meanings and new words are a fun way to expand your vocabulary. This is just an age old technique that kind of has got lost a little bit, but go back to it. Vocabulary games. Now online, you can just type in literally on Google vocabulary games, or you can go on this website mentioned here, quizlet.com. But there are so many just nice, relaxed online vocabulary games. Grab a cup of tea coffee, whatever you want, um, and just practice vocabulary. They do them, you know, from A1 to C2. So you can like test your level of vocabulary as well. But online games or flashcard games at home with your family and friends, really good. Don't underestimate the, um, the power of fun learning. Okay, tip number nine, write it down. I couldn't agree more. 
Write it down. Pen and paper, not on your phone. Pen and paper. What happened to pen and paper? Write it down. Writing down a new word, or ideally a sentence using a new word, helps fix both its meaning and spelling in your memory. Make the sentences true about you or someone you know. Couldn't agree more. Write it down. Go out and get yourself a new pad, a new pen, just for English. And you say here, you know, a little format that we might have is we might have the word at the top, definition below, pronunciation, roots, suffix, prefixes. And then we have a sentence using that word, but applying it to our own lives. That kind of format can really help you to improve your vocabulary, but write it down, pen and paper, word, definition, information, sentence. Repeat that process. Okay, and technique number 10, this one is brilliant. Speak it into reality. It is not easy to actively recall a new word or phrase in the moment. Even if you have tried hard to memorize it, to change this, once again, Record yourself speaking for two to four minutes without stopping. You could describe the world around you or give your opinion on a particular topic. Next, listen to the recording of your speech and notice which words you used. Did you use any of the new words you'd like to activate? Did you use any familiar words that could be replaced with new words? Afterwards, make a new recording. Is it any better? I think this is such a superb idea. Um, talk about something. So pick a topic, earth, travel, cars, cooking. Set yourself a goal of just talking about it for two minutes. Now, when you talk about it, you're not trying to, you know, change the world. You're not trying to put the world to rights, but you're just chatting about it. Do that. Record yourself and then listen back. And as you listen back, I've done this a few times, you realize that you repeat words. I say good way too much. But you realize that you repeat words or you're repeating sentence structures. So then you realize, OK, I could try this instead and, and change it up a little bit. But that is the idea. Speak it into reality. So I really do encourage you, if you want to improve and remember that vocabulary, record yourself. It really, really does help. Great um, ideas there. So we had 10 techniques to look at. Absolutely brilliant article, um, Svetlana. Thank you so much for that. Brilliant. Okay, so there you go. Let me know in the comments, are you going to put any of those into practice? Is there anything you like to do to help you learn new vocabulary? But that is the idea of the English natter. I'm still not sold on the name. Let me know. Maybe we could change that name. But that is the idea. Just talk about different things in English. Look at some vocabulary read an article maybe next time we'll read a story let me know i want to answer your questions in these podcasts i want it to be nice and relaxed and informal mainly just so you can hear natural english because you know sometimes when i prepare youtube videos or it's very scripted you know this is just natural so yeah let me know if you enjoyed it thank you to everybody that's listening um everybody that's watching this you know i really do hope you enjoyed it give it a thumbs up subscribe like, whatever, interact in any way, mostly positive. But if you feel you need to interact negatively, that is your prerogative. Go for it. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you for watching. My name is Gideon and I'll be back with the English Natter soon if you enjoyed it. Have a good one, guys.